Good evening all, and welcome to tonight's TI Technology Webinar, hosted by Texas Instruments Australia. I was just seeing if um, my screen was going to move, and then I just realized I was pressing the wrong arrow. So there we go. We're cooking with gas tonight. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us, and we are going to be doing a session on middle school mathematics with the TI-84 technology uh, with myself, John Bayman, and Isabel Hoadley. I teach mathematics to Year 7 to 12 students of a Lachlan Catholic College in Darwin, where I use TI technology to help students make stronger connections in their understanding of mathematics. And I'm very excited to introduce our other Darwin-based TI trainers this evening, Miss Isabel Hoadley. Good evening, Izzy. Good evening. Isabel is a colleague of mine at O'Loughlin Catholic College in Darwin and is an enthusiastic, dynamic teacher. I have to admit, I am somewhat in awe of her bio biography. Um, I was going to say biology then, that would have been all wrong. Um, although I've just said it now, which <laughs> really doesn't help. Sorry, Izzy. <laughs> Um, definitely lucky she's a colleague of mine. Although completely justified when you see the professionalism she shows in her teaching and the respect she has for her students and putting up with uh, peers with their bad jokes. Um, Izzy, um, it's fantastic that you could join us, so thank you. Uh, tonight um, I will be looking at how we can use images to strengthen students' understanding of um, the mathematics involved um, in the world around them. So we're trying to think of things that progress on from the TI-80 uh, 30XB that you may be using. Um, that calculator looks like that. Um, or equally, if you have other calculators that you're thinking of transitioning onto the TI-84. So we will be um, doing some stuff to do with images. And also, I'll be looking at some programming, some stuff that I use at the moment. With, with middle school students, we do have some um, class sets of the TI-84 calculators, and I use those with uh, students in years seven to nine at the current stage, and, and they really are loving the programming. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of that. Um, and I'm very excited to see that um, Izzy's going to talk about some transformation of graphing. I know that she's used it um, quite extensively with her year 11s and 12s, but also um, we can see show, she's going to show how that can be um, implemented into the middle school as easily. And especially now on the new color TI-84 CE, the probability simulation app is, um, looks even cooler than before and um, really engages students. So on that note, and talking you up there, Izzy, so I'm really excited about this, I'm going to pass up the over, everything over to you and um, look forward to learning a bit more about uh, transform, transformation of graphs and the probability simulation app. Fantastic. All yours, Izzy, I can see your screen. Perfect. Great. Um, all right, well, the first thing um, that I want to start off with is looking at some probability. Uh, and through the Australian curriculum for Year 7, Year 8, and Year 9, um, there's a really big emphasis on using um, experimental probability and probability simulations um, to get students to have an understanding of the difference between experimental probability and theoretical probability. So um, on the TI-84, we can find all of these probability simulations that you can see here under the apps menu. So if you go into apps, it's the number zero down, so if I just go all the way down just so you can see it, um, it's there and if we click enter, these are the different kinds of simulations um, that we can have. Uh, the first thing we should probably mention is this, it just says speed here. So if your students are using brand new calculators, um, they, if you don't see them first, um, you might get all numbers that are exactly the same or vice versa, if you would like them to have all the numbers at the same, you need to see them as well. So if you go into speed, which is um, clicking that zoom button there, um, if you want them all to be different, just set students to have a different seed number initially. If you want them to be the same, um, set them all, set the whole class to have exactly the same numbers and they'll get the exact same probabilities um, every time. So let's go to two and click OK. Um, the first simulation I want to talk about is using uh, the um, coin toss. So with the coin toss, if we go into here, um, in terms of an actual simulation, I, I don't think that this is maybe one of the best ones because obviously we've only got two options. Um, but if we can see here, you can toss the coin and then we can increase the sample size um, dramatically by, say, 50. And I think it's a really nice idea for students to kind of see, you know, where's the point where you have equal probabilities of getting tails and heads. Um, if we look then at 
if we go back and go into set, um, you've got some different options that you can um, select. So I think that the advantage of coin toss is that you can choose having different numbers of coins. So if we select two um, and click OK, um, now if we toss the coins, say, 100 times, um, students can see really easily that you, by having, you know, a one head, one tail, um, um, what I'm looking for, um, outcome, you have a much higher probability of that than having uh, zero heads or two heads. Um, and that, again, likewise for three, and you can get students to kind of predict what they think the three outcome would look and then show that to them um, as well. And this leads in really nicely to talking about, I guess, binomial distribution um, later on in school. Um, I think the other advantage of this one um, is that we can see um, the data in here if we're looking at the table. So if we wanted to write the list of that, we could convert those lists um, into the stat plot on the calculator. Um, and we can also see the table of the data too. Okay, so that's showing all the different outcomes. Um, if we go back and look at the rolling dice, um, this one I think is really excellent. And the reason why I, I really like this is because if we go into the set menu again, um, firstly, we have lots and lots of different outcomes, uh, lots of, sorry, sorry, lots and lots of different sides of dice that we can choose from, which might not be available um, in schools to look at um, in a physical sense. So we can select, you know, a 10-sided, 12-sided, 20-sided dice. Um, but what I really like about the dice app is that if we go into this advanced menu um, down the bottom, we can um, change the dice so that it's no longer fair. So say, for example, um, I want to weight um, this side of five doubly compared to all the other sides, I can change that way into two and that's going to adjust all the probabilities. So if we go now back into our settings, um, we can see that when we roll the dice, um, we get um, a different probability. And what I think what I really like about this is I do a similar kind of investigation with this with, with my U9 students where I get them to make their own dice and we actually do it as part of the measurement topic instead of the probability topic. But once they've made their dice, um, we talk about whether or not it's fair. Um, and I get them to roll the dice to see how fair it is. And usually when I ask them, you know, how, how many times do you think you need to roll it, they would say six first up. And if they get every number once, then that means that it's fair. Um, but if you use this kind of simulation, you can see really nicely that at, we've rolled this dice 52 times and five and six have got a reasonably equal probability. Um, so obviously we need to have a much larger sample size to work out whether or not something is a fair test. Uh, the next... Izzy? Yes? I've used that same um, activity with, with my middle school students and, and just used the mm -hmm. Smart View um, on the data projector just as one, one calculator. So that's another option we could do with middle school students. But with the coin toss, set it up beforehand to be, to be biased. And then the students have yeah. to try and predict which coin, uh, which uh, side of the dice is, um, has got, is weighted more or which one's going to come up more often. Obviously, it would be the opposite number that would be weighted, but actually, physically, that would come up more often. Um, and it's quite interesting how they, they predict wrong quite early on, especially if you just keep the numbers yes. low. So, um, I think that, again, yes. just reinforces that difference between theoretical property and practical, uh, uh, practical property. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the next one that I really like is um, using the marbles. And I think this one has its advantage when you start looking at replacement and without replacement. Um, so again, if we go into the set menu, um, we, I want to run this with only three different kinds of marbles. Um, and after each um, selection, we don't want to replace the marble anymore. So I'm just going to change that to no. Um, and then again, if we go into advanced, you can actually alter the numbers of marbles that you've got as well. So I'm going to change A to, to um, B to 4 and C to 1. Um, now if we go back. Um, the settings have changed, we've got our three marbles, and if we pick them out, um, we can work out the probability, and this would be really nice, I think, for using, um, with starting off with tree diagrams with um, replacement and without replacement. Uh, the very last one that I think is probably good for middle school is just looking at drawing cards, um, which is the fifth one. And I think that um, this one's really nice because as a teacher, I know um, that when I've started doing probability with students, I assume that they have quite a lot of understanding about 
um, what a deck of cards actually looks like, which is not <laughs> necessarily the case. Um, so it's nice to kind of um, introduce that so that they become a little bit more familiar with it later on. So if we draw the cards, we can see that our first draw um, is an ace of space. Um, and that, I think, is all I'm going to talk about with this one here. All right. Sorry, I'll just keep going. Okay. Um, the next one I'm going to do is also looking at um, a probability, but instead of using um, the probability simulation, uh, we can use random integer to do um, a different kind of simulation. So our problem is that we're watching a basketball game, um, there's no time left, and we have someone who's getting a three throw, um, and they have a 70% chance that they're um, going to be able to shoot um, that throw. So if we go into the math menu and across to probability, um, the fifth one down in the math menu says random integer, and this will just select any um, number between our upper and our lower boundary. So because we've got a 70% chance um, of making a shot, I'm just going to set it up so we've got 10 numbers being selected. So our lowest number is going to be zero, our highest number is going to be nine. Um, and just to show you how it works, we'll just select two numbers to start off with um, and paste that in. Um, and what we should end up with here is that we've got an, um, our first number selected as an eight, our second number selected as a three. So I've made up this problem, but you probably want to get your students to do it themselves, um, so that the numbers from zero to two is going to represent a missed shot, and three to nine is going to represent the shot being made. So if we've got an eight and a three, that would mean that we're making both shots. Um, but again, hopefully by the stage your students are doing this kind of problem, um, they know that doing one trial isn't um, a good representation. So if I just copy this command here, um, and I'm just going to change that to to 50, and I'm going to store that into um, my list one um, in my stat plot. So if I enter that in there, um, we're going to end up with 50 numbers, and that's going to represent um, the first shot that um, the player makes. I'm just going to copy that command again um, and change the list one to list two, um, and that's going to represent the second shot. Now, if I go into my table, you should see, sorry, I need to just delete these quickly. Sorry, this is me practicing to myself before. I've already got it in there. Um, okay, so we can see here um, we have all the 50 shots in this one and this two. So now if we go down and just check, yep, we've got 50 there. That's good. Um, from here, we can see that if we just look at this first, um, set of data. Uh, for our first shot, we've got zero, so that means that we're going to miss that shot. Second shot, we've got two, so again, we're going to miss that shot as well. Um, what you could do, I guess, is just get students to go through and count it up, but that's going to be quite time consuming. So we can probably do it a little bit more mathematically um, and think that in, for our first shot, it's going to succeed if that number is greater than two. So we can choose this one. Um, and we can say that if that number is going to be greater than, sorry, to get to that, you just go second in test, uh, second in math, and that'll give you a test menu. So if it's going to be greater than two, that means we're going to get that shot. And we should end up with a zero if the shot's missed and a one if it's successful. Um, we'll then do the second thing in list four using the second shot, so list two. So list two is also, we want that to be greater than two. Um, and we can see there um, that, again, if it's greater than two, it's successful. If it's um, less than two, it's not. Um, from here, again, you could probably go and just get students to count it up, but it is going to take quite a long time. So hopefully what they will realise is that if altogether they have a total score of two, that means they're going to win the game. A score of one would mean that they would draw. A score of zero would mean that they would lose. So in here, we can add up um, our results from this three and our results from this four. Um, and we can see here we've either got a zero, a two, or a one. Then in our list six, um, we know that we're going to win the game if our total score altogether is equal to two. So we can say that if our list five, um, and again, to get the equals, we get a test. If our list five is equal to two, that means that we're going to have been um, successful and won the game. So if we enter that there, um, we can see that 
we have some wins and some losses. And then just to add that up, we can go into um, our list across the math and the fifth option down says sum. So if we add that up, we want all of the sum of all of our values in list six, we can see that we have won the game 25 times, which um, gives us a 50% probability. If we compare this with the theoretical probability, we're looking at a seven out of 10 probability of making the first shot, a seven out of 10 probability of making the second shot. So altogether we're looking at 49%, so pretty close. Um, and ideally, I think as a class, I would want all the students to do it and um, add them all together and work out the average um, and see how close we can get that to actually being 49. All right. That's nice, isn't it? Um, Excellent. No worries. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about before I pass back over to John um, is looking at some linear programming. Um, and linear programming, I think, um, comes in um, in around about year eight or year nine. Um, or just comes in at year eight and year nine. Um, and um, like John says, I've used transformation graphing a lot with my year 11s and year 12s just to get them a bit of a handle on what transformations um, do to a function. But I think we kind of maybe miss that a little bit when we're talking out with linear equations because there's obviously not a huge number of things we have to think about. Um, so to get to the transformation graphing app, we go back into apps um, and it's the very, very last thing in the applications menu. So in here, um, we just go back into our regular y equals screen um, and I'm going to input my linear equation, which is, um, we're just going to call it ax plus b. Um, and then if I go into window um, and in settings, there's a whole lot of different settings that we can use for transformation graphing. So the first one I'm going to look at is just this one that's highlighted here that's got the play and the kind of pause button. Um, first thing I want to get students to understand is what happens when we change um, the gradient. So I want my gradient to start off at um, negative one um, and it's going to increase by one. So if I now go to graph, we can see that here and if I press um, this arrow here, we're going to move that um, line to change by increasing the gradient by one. Um, I don't actually like having this just being moved by hand. I think the transformation graphing app um, works a lot better when we actually turn it on and students can see it automated. So hang on. I'm just, if we go to that play button, um, that will um, animate the transformation. And if we use the double play button, that'll just make it run a little bit faster. So if we pick up play, I want my A value to start, we're gonna start at negative three. Um, I'm going to set my y step to one and um, I want the maximum to go up to positive three. So now if we go to graph, we can see that as the gradient changes, so does the slope of the line and hopefully what students are realizing is that when it's negative, the line's um, decreasing and when it's positive, your line's increasing. Um, again, if you want to look into that a little bit more visually again, um, oh, the other thing, my students find it really hard to stop this from moving. So to pause it, you press enter, um, and then you can go back and re-edit it. So if we go back into setup, um, and I just want to turn this trail on. Um, and if we turn the trail on, we can actually see um, the line staying as um, the gradient changes. And that gives, I think, a slightly better picture um, of what's happening. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pause that again and go back into setup. Um, with changing the y-intercept, um, you just go back and highlight b instead. Um, I'm going to change that gradient back to being one and make the y-intercept start out again at negative three. I'm going to keep it as play with the trail on um, and go up to a maximum of three. Um, and now if we go into the graph, um, I really like this one because we can straight away see um, all the lines are parallel um, and they're just increasing by one every time we change that b value. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Um, what I was um, thinking was that if I was running this in class to say like a, a year nine group of kids who already have a reasonably good handle on um, gradients and y-intercepts, 
Um, the next thing I probably do is give them, and I'm just going to increase the screen a little bit here, um, is give them a set of linear equations with some um, different gradients, um, but make all the lines the same color. And I probably show you this on the projector in my classroom um, and tell them that these are the equations of the graphs um, that are shown on the screen. And try and get them to think then about which one matches up with which. So hopefully if they've um, got a good handle using transformation graphing and also doing a little bit more consolidation, um, they'll look at this and they might say, well, this line here is increasing. That means it's going to have a positive gradient. So it's going to be either x plus 2 or 2x plus 2. Um, and it's increasing slightly less, um, or slightly, slightly um, more gradually than this line here. So that means that the gradient's going um, to be smaller. So that line there should be our x plus 2. Um, if we go then, then go back into y equals, to get them to check, we can just change that x plus 2 to a different color. So I'm going to make that one purple. Um, and then if we go back into graph, we can see that that line is indeed purple. So that's our x plus 2 function. Um, the last thing I want to talk about for linear programming is um, using um, tables to identify a linear equation. Um, so, um, first thing is um, looking at the um, increase um, between, sorry, I'm just going to set this back for a second. Okay, so um, quite often I think we see this, this type of question in a textbook where um, we've got a table, um, we've got an increase in y values, and because we've got a in, uh, constant increase in y values, then students can say that that's a linear equation. Um, but I know when I had my year nines last year, if I gave them a question that looked like this one here um, on the right, um, they would straight away look at that and just think, I'm not doing it because it's got fractions. Um, and I was thinking, I was trying to think of a good way that we could get around them having that kind of aversion to fractions and still get the idea of having a constant increase. So if we look at this set of y values and put this into our calculator by um, going second, we use the set brackets, um, and I'm just going to input those y values, so 3 over 2, um, 2, Two, five over two, and three, whoops, three and seven over two. Um, and I just want to store those into um, the list one. So if I store those into this one, um, I end up with that set of values, which is what we want. Um, now, if I want to work out what the change in those values are, if I go um, into the list menu um, and across to ops, that seventh option down has um, the change in the list. So if I select seven um, and type in L1, we should be able to see that um, even though it might not necessarily appear to students like you've got a consistent rate of increase because you're changing between fractions and integers, um, we can actually work out that that would be a linear equation. Um, and I also really like this for um, senior school. Um, if you're looking at doing some extension with your nines and looking at quadratics, um, because say, for example, if we go into stat um, and in our L1, we just type in some values, so negative 1, 0, um, 1, 2, 3, cool. 3 and 4. Um, in list 2, say we're looking at just um, x squared. Um, so if we take our list 1 squared and enter that, um, we get our squared values. And now if we go out, um, we can look at our change in our L2. And we get that set of values there. We can store that answer um, as list 3. Um, and then we can look at the change um, in those list three values. And we can see that for a quadratic, um, our, second, um, our second change gives us a constant rate of increase. 
as well. Um, and so you could, I guess, as an extension um, to your year nine students, get them to think, start thinking about quadratics and their relationship to linear equations. And even if you have some really good ones, really good ones, we can talk about cubics as well. Um, the last thing I wanted to quickly mention is back with graphing and using um, the tables to um, um, get a kind of deeper understanding of linear equations as well. So in here, I'm just going to delete all of these. Um, and I'm also going to quit out of the transformation graphing as well. Um, and in here, I'm just going to make my equation 2x plus 1. Um, and if we're going to mode, you should be able to see here that we have this graph table option so that we can see both the graph and the table on the one screen. So if we go into there, we can see um, our graph and our equation. Um, but in this case, I want to set up the table so that, um, which I already have done here, um, I want to set it up so that instead of automatically determining what um, our x value and our y value is, we want it to ask instead. Um, and I'm just going to change this so that we can't actually see it anymore. And go back into table. Um, and if I delete these ones I did before, I know that I've put in this equation 2x plus 1, but my students might not necessarily know that. So if I kind of keep that hidden and go into the table settings, um, if I put in, say, a value of 1, uh, we can say we get 3. If I put in 5, we end up with 11. If we put in 6, we end up with 13. And so I think this is kind of a nice exercise for students to use um, this to work out maybe what the next um, option in the sequence would be. So if we say, for example, had um, an x value of 8, um, what would be our y value? And getting them to use the table to predict what that would be. And it's a nice um, way of uh, confirming that they're right straight away as well. Okay, all right, I think I'm done. That's lovely, Liz. Um, just staying on that for, for a few minutes, I use that quite a lot in mm. class, again, using the smart view, and then either will, will freeze the screen while I change the equation uh, or just mute yeah. it. Um, but, yeah, the students really like it, and to start with, when you first start playing that game, if you get them to call the numbers out, um, you'll end up with quite a lot. Um, I get them to try and guess the, the, uh, the formula uh, or the rule or mm -hmm. the linear equation, and then, you know, we can flip yeah. across the y equals. But if we leave it, um, to start with, they may come up with quite a lot of the different numbers that they choose, and then as it goes on, they sort of go, hang on a minute, we've got to do this a bit smarter, and then they'll start tightening up which ones they look like, uh, which ones they look at. So it's really quite an interesting um, game to do. So, yeah, that's a lovely. And um, some fantastic things there, really nice use of, of using lists as well. Um, so you've certainly given us a lot of uh, food for thought there, Izzy. Thank you very much. All right. So leading on from what Izzy was, was talking about um, in terms of uh, li linear graphs um, and, and graphing in general. Um, now with the new TI-84 plus CE, you, you should know that um, uh, we can put images on there. Uh, some of the images are already pre-installed on there already. Uh, so if we go into format, and I'm going to scroll up, make it a bit quicker to background, um, and we go to the right, we've got some images already uh, pre-installed. Um, obviously, on the size of my screen, they don't look um, as great because we're making it quite large. Um, they look much better on the, on the students' handhelds. And if you're going to choose some images yourself, then I recommend that you choose them um, with low resolution. Uh, because obviously, there's only so many pixels on the screen. It's quite an interesting exercise to talk to the students about that anyway. Or equally, um, we can change the view of the calculator and hide the big screen to the side and just have it like this, and it looks much better anyway like that. Um, so there's some already installed, and, and we could use this one quite nicely to link in with what uh, Izzy was talking about, about um, linear equations. Uh, but sometimes it's nice for students to find their own. I'll send them around uh, the school with their phones um, or um, you know, with an iPad or something to get, get some images. So this was one that one of my students collected from when they went to pick their friends up from another school. Um, so I'm just going to string that down. Here's the image here, and it's just a um, very different forms that you can actually save it in. Um, so if I want to put it onto Smart View, then I need to click onto the um, magnifying icon. Or if I want to put it onto the handhelds, then I need to download a free piece of software called TI Connect, which I have down the bottom here. And I then also go to the, to the magnifying glass. And you'll see that that's my calculator connected at the moment. 
um, just to, to prove that to you, I can show you, I take a screenshot of that and show you something that's actually um, on my screen now that I was doing with some students in class today. So that's what I was doing in class today, so that's a screenshot. But I would go to here and I simply would grab whichever image I wanted to, let's say this one here, and I'd drag and drop it across and it would then come onto my handheld. Um, notice the pre-installed ones are normally one to six, so I normally try and keep it a bit higher. Um, and now that image will now be onto my handheld and I can use it there. But for this situation, I'm going to use uh, the Smart View, the teacher version. So same thing, I'm going to grab the, the image and dump it across. Same thing, it'll ask me where I want to put it. Um, and equally, students can either grab those images off of each other by using the um, mini USB to mini USB cable and using the link function on the, on the handheld. Um, just wait for that to upload. And we can, so if we may, I may leave it like that on this screen, just so we can, we can see what's going on and which buttons I'm pressing. Um, like I said, there's the link button that you'd use if you wanted students to send it to each other. It won't come up on mine because it's a smart view, but um, that's the one you actually use if you're going to do it. So at the moment, um, we've got this image that I had on from before. I'm going to go zoom um, standard. We could move the axes around where we want it. It's not a touch screen. Uh, it's not allowed in the exams to have a touch screen um, in the US especially, so that's why it's not a touch screen. Um, so we're going to go back into format, and the image that I had actually put on there earlier was from the school. There it is. And, uh, and it was a wheelchair access ramp up rather than going up the steps to the side. So we now press enter on that. And there it is there. So what would you want the, the students to do? Well, there's many different things to do, but one of the ones they could actually do is find out the slope of that, of that line. So a nice way to do that is to go into stat um, across to um, uh, calculate, and then I've arrowed up to get to the bottom. We can fit any quick uh, plot to it. So if you had more senior students or um, uh, advanced year 9 into year 10, then you may want to use for quadratics and other other graphs, but for now I'm just going to use this simple one, the manual fit. Um, this works quite nicely on um, matching it to uh, scatter plots as well, if you wanted to use that. So we're just going to do a manual fit, a bit like a line of best fit that we used to do. I'm going to store that equation um, in Y1. The uh, quickest way for me to do that is alpha F4 is a quick key, and there's Y1. And we now, we're then, have, now I'm going to drop the points. Now I'm going to drop it on that um, barrier that you can see there, so that it will match the same. And the interesting um, how accurate I get it with um, the image on, on such a small screen like that, if I wanted to move it to the side and make it bigger, so that would be my excuse if it doesn't work out quite right. So there we go. So we've got a gradient of 0 0.128. Um, and I thought that I'd do a bit of, bit of research on this. Um, and the school ramps, apparently, so um, this one particular website said should be somewhere between um, 1 in 14 and 1 in 20. So let's see how I've done. So 1 in 14 and 1 in 20. Let's just move that across a bit. Oops, didn't mean to do that, sorry. There we go. So what do we get there? 0 0.128. Um, I, that value, um, if I remember rightly, so let's go click done now. Okay. So there it is now stored in there, um, 0 0.128. If we quit that, quit that and do 1. Um, to the ratio, of, well, it would be actually divided by 15, won't it, which is a ratio, um, is 0 0.06, and 1 divided by 21 is 0 0.47. So was I off there, Is I think I was a fair um, bit off, wasn't I? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Let's try that again, <laughs> because when I did that, um, thanks for your politeness there, when I did this the other day, um, it actually came out pretty, pretty spot on. So let's do it again. Let's have a look at that. Uh, Maybe it's a little bit off, but um, it should come through pretty good there. Maybe you can see that the axial angle's not not as as spot on as it should be, um, and perhaps just even just a slight variation in that. We're not talking very much that we could actually look at that. But again, um, with lots of assignments that we do with the students, especially as they go up through the school, we're not necessarily worried about it being exactly the same. But discussing about why it may not be and the limitations and the um, the errors that may have occurred in that. So that's a nice way that we can use images and really easy to just drag and drop them across. Um, as you can see, if you were going up um, in, through into the, the more senior years, then you can actually go into some of the other images. Um, we've got a, a, a snowboarder, and we could actually fit, fit quadratics to that one.
So remember, please send any any questions that you may have as as we're talking through this. Izzy's uh, monitoring that at the moment, and we can we can look through that and um, answer any questions you may have. So those are the images that I used, and I was looking at how comparing the slope. And obviously, also, I suppose talking about errors, um, it would be telling whether I took the photo horizontally or not as well. So that would be my excuse, and perhaps I should have used maybe that line of the paper. But maybe if the photo wasn't taken horizontally, they would be causing the error there compared to the steps yeah, and looking at the slope compared. Uh, what do you reckon, Izzy? I don't reckon that double blue line is from both sides of the rail. Is that what you Thank you very much. You're just making yeah. me feel better now. Um, I am. So the second, <laughs> the second part that um, I'm really excited about using on, on the calculators, and, and for, for lots of reasons, and, and I'll explain a bit more um, in the final section, is the programming side of the, the calculators. Um, this I find really powerful for all students. Um, and I, I really feel that the, the younger we can bring this into the students, that, um, the more that the deeper understanding they'll get of the mathematics. So we're going to go into program, and they're going to get the students to create their own little program. So I've used this um, with my year uh, sevens in the past, when we've been looking at um, area of triangles. I've used it with, with year eights. So I've used it with my year nines, when we've looked at Pythagoras' theorem um, up through the school, year tens and elevens. And, and they all really enjoy it. And you only have to show them a little bit, and then they will just fly. So we're going to go across to... We're going to go across to new. We're going to create a new one, and let's um, call this one um, just. In, oops, I'm not going to do that. I'm not. Um, but notice that what I actually had on originally was this A symbol. That means that alpha locks on, which means I'm going to get all the green buttons um, or the green um, green emblems. So I just took that off. So let's put it back on again. So I'm just going to call it AA, ingeniously named, and we're going to create a program to let's find the area of a triangle. So I get the students to think about, well, if you want to get a computer to find the area of a triangle, then the computer needs or the calculator needs to know uh, the answer to some questions and what questions would they be. So um, we go back into program again. Once they realize that it's going to be, they need to tell them the two lengths of the triangle, if it, especially if it's a right angle triangle to start with anyway. We can see how this can, can build. CTL stands for control. I slash O stands for input output, and that's what we're focusing on for now. Um, the hub over here to the right is on the new OS and is linked to the TI Innovator Hub, um, which I'll just mention briefly at the end. But we're going to do a prompt. And what are we going to ask it to prompt? Well, there's many different ways that students can write that. Uh, for now, I'm just going to say that we want the prompt for the, for the height of the triangle. And, and you could decide on better language than this. Um, and W for the width. All right, so that's what mine, mine actually is going to be at the moment. So if I run that program as it is, um, to run the program, the, the, the quick way now is to go into F5. There's another quick link in F5 and execute the program. It's going to ask me what is H. Okay, so let's go triangle that's five high. And what's the width? It's, let's say, eight wide. And it's done. And I'll say, oh, this is a really stupid calculator. Surely why can't it tell me the area? And obviously students will say, well, you haven't you know, given it any calculations to do. So we can add that in now. So what would the formula be? So they know that they're going to do half of the height times the width. And again, we want that to be stored as a new variable. So we're going to store that as A. And then we can then um, display that value. So that, again, is an output. So back into program, cross the input output. We're going to display that the area of this triangle is this value. And notice that it's a bit um, just ordinary at the moment. Students will have to know that's the program they use. No, there's no language with it or no, no text. So let's just run that, alpha F5 again, execute that program. And what's the height? Five. What's the width? Eight. And again, I get the students to, to think about what that answer is before I press enter. I want them to know that uh, they're using this as a checker. Um, so they should know that the area of that is 20, it's a triangle. And yes, it is correct. Um, just a few things just to tidy that up if we want the students to, to do a bit more and, and you'd want to show them this. One is we can insert a line as int above the delete button. So we can insert a line and we could actually get the program to clear the home screen to start with. That will always let, allow it to be at the top. That's quite nice. We could also go second insert and actually have a bit of text there. So we could actually get it to... Um, go back into program and display some text. To do text, we need to have in speech marks. Um, so I'm going to alpha lock it and say, um, what would we want to say? 
Um, well, for now, we could just say area. Um, space down there above on the zero of, and being a bit lazy with the language, um, right. And you'd be surprised how quickly the um, students get used to where all the buttons are, um, quicker than me there, and that will do us. So with that now, if we run that program, so we run that program F5 again, and actually that program, it's got a clear top screen, area right of area of right try, I could add triangle there if I wanted to, I suppose. That's got different numbers, six and three, that should give us nine, yes it does. So once you show them that, there's, they'll really sort of just fly on their own and just take that on to whatever level they want. Um, but a nice way that you could take that with your year um, nines would be to look at uh, Pythagoras' theorem that's linked into that. We could perhaps look at perimeter as well with the same question. So a couple of things that I'll just tidy up. I'll make it say triangle, just because that was sort of annoying me not to see that fully. Close the speech marks and take alpha lock off. We want that still to be the case. Um, before we display A, um, then we would want the students let me just insert another line. We want the students to say that that is the area. Um, so again, we can go program and input output, display a piece of text, lock it, alpha lock it again, display um, area, space above the, on the zero, is, um, and we can actually put a space there, and we can either have that display as a separate line Oops, sorry. Or we could actually just put comma and then have A on the end there. So that will work now. Um, what else do we want? We're going to do Pythagoras theorem. We need another calculation happening here. Second insert. So we want um, it to have a sec another another value in here. So what would that be? Well, Pythagoras is theorem. We've got the, the height, the width of a right angle triangle. So um, we're going to do the square root of one of the lengths squared plus the other length, which are called W squared, and that then will store that as a new value. So obviously, it's interesting with the students, though, they may be used to using H for the hypotenuse. If they do this, it, it will, they will get away with it because it's um, not in a loop but you want to try and encourage the students to not use the same variable all the time. So let me just come up with um, a different one um, ingeniously. Let's call it C. Um, so we're going to then go display, put the alpha lock on again. And for now, I'm just going to write it that the perimeter okay, is, oops, sorry, just took alpha off. Speech mark, comma. Um, so, okay, so what's that going to be? Well, the perimeter, well, that will only give me a value here, so I've missed something out again. And this is why it's quite nice for the students that let's just run this program um, and see. So we want the perimeter. What do we want it to be? Well, we want it to be uh, the H value plus the width plus. Now, I expect that this won't work. I haven't done it this way before, but I expect it won't work. But it's not a problem. Um, um, it'll be interesting to see, one, if it does, and then also um, the students for, to, to modify and to think why it doesn't. They'll they get that immediate feedback, and they, they rarely actually come back and, and check with, our, uh, with us as teachers. They actually try and work it out uh, on their own, in, the, in my experience. Here we go. So this time I'm going to use a number that, that we know is a bit, uh, we know the answer to that. So we're going to go three for the height um, and four for the width. That will give us an area of six and a perimeter of 12. So let's see how that looks. Ah. There you go. It worked. Success. There you go. It surprised me that we could make that look. We could make that look prettier. We can move where this value splits it out. Um, but there you go for now. And then what I then do is I would then get the students to um, try and break. Um, I will try and break their program so they will then create that. Whether it be in class. So imagine that this um, is. Um, what's the best way to explain it? So I know what I'll do. If we go to TI Connect, or if the students were doing this as a piece of homework, um, on the 
on the TI Connect, the Hilus Calculator Connected, um, I'll just shrink that one down. We can, um, the students would connect their calculator to TI Connect. They would scroll down and find whichever program it was that they used. So we can see here that, where are we? Can I find one that would be sort of like it? Um, doesn't really matter. I don't know why I'm even worrying. There you go. Area one. They would grab that program. They would dump it over onto their desktop, and they can then send me that program. And that could be their piece of homework. They can just send that in an email. I equally can then grab that same form, uh, program um, onto my just my smart view, and then I can upload it quite easily. Um, just give it a second to upload. Quite easily back onto my calculator again, onto my computer. Um, equally. Uh, while it's doing that, as I said to you earlier, um, I'm just going to show you um, the screenshots. If you use the link button, so I'm just pressing this, the link button now on my on my handheld. So I think that's important that students uh, share the calculators around, uh, so they can share the programs and, and this, the work from each other, especially like from topics like science where they may have some data that they're using. That would be the, the first button they'd press on the on the link button. They would go down and they would find their program. Let me take another photo so you can see what I'm talking about. There they are. They selected one, and then they would arrow across to the right and press transmit. Um, their friend, um, who would also have the same, um, I would press also link, but this time they wouldn't press uh, send or they would go across to receive. So they would then go to the receive section of the um, document, and then they would receive the, the program from their friend. So really useful, really easy to do. Um, and you can see that that one now, that program that I sent across a second ago uh, to my handheld um, for area is now there. That's that program just dropped across onto here. So very easy to share it around um, and make it accessible for, for other students. Um, have I missed anything with that programming, Izzy? Have I missed anything with that programming, Izzy? Um, I don't think so, unless you were going to show how you'd break it. But. Oh, yes, there was. That's exactly what I was. Thank you very much, indeed. Okay. Um, yes, that's where I was leading. Um, so when the students <laughs> send it to me, um, <laughs> and um, I get the program then, obviously I want to test it to start with, just to make sure it works. Um, so 5, 12, we know we should get um, 30 and 30 equally for these two, so that, that one works. But then I would say to students, okay, we're now going to try your program again, minus three and six, and we'll see that it still works. So um, the students may say, well, yeah, but you wouldn't type in minus three. Well, I say, well, but you need to have some extra um, lines of code in there to stop that happening. Um, so to do that, then what the students would do um, is go back into their program, and they can add some more um, if and then statements and else statements, so that they can also all learn about as well. Um, now, that links in, I think, quite nicely with um, if you're not confident with coding and you're not confident um, with how to actually um, code on the TI calculator, then do not fear. You don't need to be the expert. Um, at my school, we uh, have a teacher taking a group of students this year, and they're going to do quite a bit of coding with the calculators, and, and he doesn't know very much. And I said, well, you don't need to worry because uh, if we go to the TI Australia website, you can see it says TI Australia over here, and we go down into Teachers and go to TI Codes, then all the coding information that you need is on here. So the TI84 Plus CE is here, and they're all in little 10 minute chunks of code. So if we just look on the 10 minutes of code, so um, if, you know, if you want to get your students to do it this way, or you want to look yourself on how you can do it, here's some if statements. So let me go to Unit 4. There's the teacher notes. How good's that? They're already created. And you can just work through the skill builders for each of the units. Um, step one, here we go. And it will just lead you through. There's the, the test functions that um, Izzy used earlier, um, fantastically well with the probability stuff and the lists. So it just leads you nicely through it. Um, and like I said, if you do want the teacher notes, they're available for you there as well. Also, there we go. Also, um, down below, which is very useful, um, is the TI Basic Resources. And in there is the e-guide. So if there was something in particular that you wanted to know, then 
go to the search menu um, and at the top type in what you're looking for and it will tell you um, what it will be on there. Or you can equally go to content and find it all in here, whatever you want to do. So there's a load on input and output statements and here's a load on control statements and you would just choose whichever one you want. Um, I'm using this more and more with my students and I find that once you've shown them a little bit on how to do it, they'll just go off and they'll fly with it and they'll use it in so many different contexts. Um, and it doesn't worry me for whether they do tests um, or their exam. Uh, one reason is that I can always clear the calculators if I want to, which I probably wouldn't need to do. Um, I can set my questions up in my tests so that they would have to show more detail and they would have to use exact values. They couldn't use their calculators. Um, or it can be a non-calculator. Uh, part of the paper, which is what we do um, in SACE, SACE um, both Northern Territory and South Australia do this sometimes non-calculated components. So I'm not worried, but I really genuinely feel that it does deepen their understanding. Um, the other place that um, the coding has now come into its own um, is, I don't know if you're aware of the TI Innovator Hub. Um, these um, are made by the, the parent company of TI, um, which are called the launch pads. And these are like Arduinos um, or Raspberry Pi boards, um, and they come in this little student-proof box. Now, if you actually have the launch pad as a, U a university engineer in America, it will be not in this plastic box, but um, it, for a student, it's inside this plastic box. And we do a lot of, a lot of coding on that as well. Um, I, in fact, I was using this uh, with my um, students today um, when we were creating music using the speaker on the bottom of that. Uh, again, there's, there's tons of resources here for you to access. Um, and there's the e-guide again, all linked to it. There's um, coming out later this year is going to be the, the car that um, Izzy and I have been lucky enough to get a sneak peek of where we've got uh, distance sensors on the front, there's color sensors on the bottom. Um, you can put a pen in it and draw some, get the students to draw um, with it and create their own programs to draw different shapes. And we can add more input and output sensors on the sides. So this is really exciting. And again, if you need some more support with that, then um, you go into, oh, it's taking me to the US site. I was just wondering there what happened there. Um, you would then go into Teachers, TI Codes, and here it is here. We've got the 10 minutes of code for the Innovator Hub. Um, this is fantastic. Is there anything you'd like to say on the Innovator Hub? Um, no, not particularly. Maybe just um, the sensors, but that would be. It. Um, so, so I mean, one of the good things about the Innovator Hub is that you can um, put in sensors to um, read certain variables and then get that to be displayed on the calculator. Yeah. Um, and that's probably one of the one of the best things about it. Um, so that's probably all I'd mention. Yeah. So that's um, if I wrote it from here, um, we actually could go um, uh, into the STEM component of it, um, and that's what Izzy's talking about about actually taking it even further. Um, and using it with sensors and adding bits to it so we can actually go through um, here and use the innovator. So, yeah, I agree with you. Um, I was talking to my students today when we were doing the sound, it's actually to take it even further and start making our own theremin and having a, a distance sensor that then controls where it um, measures the distance of the hand to the, to the box and they actually work it out that way. Um, if you're after some more resources as well as what Izzy and I have showed you today, um, the Australia site's been updated, but if you change over, so you just click on the Australia site, and change it to the um, America site and you upgrade it, um, click up to the America site. Um, if you go into activities, there's activity, TI Activity Central, and we can see that there's middle grade maths here um, and loads of activities here already ready for head. You can see that some are like, actually, and I didn't look at this until uh, this afternoon. I went, oh, look, we've, we've done a lot of these as well ourselves, which um, is fantastic. I will just check, that's the um, America site. If I just go back to the Australia site, I'll just check whether it has gone yet. Um, no, it hasn't, been, hasn't gone up to that level yet. So please just flip over to the American site. Um, and again, if you're after something in particular, um, there's loads of free activities available for you in here. Here's one coming up for Christmas, it tells you what Calculators, you've used a few, a, few, a few months away yet, but if you go into it, um, then you can see that there's um, a document for the students um, and there's some data that then students can download and put in. And look at that, good old teacher notes that will support us as well.
Um, oh, so right. I find as well, if, if I'm sorry, if I'm looking at the American one, that um, also the Algebra 1 and the Algebra 2 and the Geometry quite often apply to upper middle years too. Yeah, nice call. Yeah, I think that's a great call. Yeah, so all these are all available for anybody, free for you to access, um, and just got to just search it. And there's plenty of activities already made why reinvent the wheel. But thanks for that, Izzy. Um, Sorry. If, there, um, if you have any more questions as we begin to wrap it up, um, please uh, send them through, and, and Izzy and myself will um, reply to them. Uh, if not, then we'll, we'll start um, wrapping things up here. Um, so uh, when you leave the webinar tonight, uh, there will be a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Uh, your feedback does guide us, and we plan future online events, and we do listen to your feedback. Uh, so please, we, we do hope you share your thoughts in a post-webinar survey. Um, so thank you very much for doing that. Your certificate of attendance, most importantly, will be emailed to you in the next 48 hours, along with a link to the on-demand and YouTube versions of the recording. Um, as well as any other relevant documents that, as you and I, feel appropriate that you may would like to have access to. Um, if you do, um, after you leave tonight, have any other post-webinar uh, follow-up, you want to like some, please phone or email us. Um, the people uh, in Melbourne would be more than happy to transfer any queries or equally put you in touch with uh, trainers like ourselves. Um, pretty much all of us are teachers ourselves using this technology in the classroom, um, so when we actually give you some examples of what we're doing uh, or suggestions that we actually are using ourselves. We're not just sort of um, so, you know, coming, um, coming at this from a, a cold point of view. Um, so do, I do thank you all uh, for joining us this evening. Um, Izzy, thank you very much for, for sharing um, some fantastic um, ideas and, and examples on how we can use this technology in the middle school. No worries. And, and equally, thank you all for joining us. Um, we do it so that you can um, uh, enrich the, the work that you do in your classroom, and um, I hope we, you found it useful this evening. Thank you very much, and good night.